everybody. Welcome to the Cruise Consulting free pitch deck creation course designed to help people raising venture capital put together their pitch decks. This particular video and podcast is on the market size, which is one of the most important slides that the venture capitalists will be looking at. Uh, for those of you who have been following along with this free course, skip ahead about 30 seconds or so while I do the intro that you've heard a few times. I am Healy Jones. I am the VP of fp &E at Cruise Consulting. I'm a former venture capitalist and have been at startups that have raised a lot of money, have gone public. Uh, and I, my day job is advising companies as they get ready to raise funding. I am joined by Haya Camps, who is not only a well-known venture capital pitch deck consultant, he is a reporter with TechCrunch. He has written a book on how to build a venture capital pitch deck called Pitch Perfect, which you can get on Amazon. And he's also been a startup founder and has raised money and has been a venture investor with the uh, Accelerator Group. So he is very qualified. Hi, how are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? I am great. Thanks for joining us. Let's talk about the market size slide, which is a bit of a tongue twister, but what is this for? Well, it's actually pretty straightforward. Um, the market size is a really important thing to prove because uh, if there's no market for what you're doing, you're never going to make sales. We don't make sales. There's no uh, chance of raising money. So it's um, for some markets, it's super obvious because everybody goes, yeah, duh, of course there's a market. But especially if you're doing something quirky, uh, proving that your market exists and that there's a big enough market to be worth investing in uh, may actually take up a chunk of the uh, investment pitch. That's right. And this is a place where VCs are going to spend time if they don't already know the market really well. Mm -hmm. Of course, if they do already know the market really well, then you need to be careful because they may ask you some pretty intense questions and you're going to want to either have a point of view or you're going to be humble enough to try to learn from them and understand what their point of view is and what their experience is. Now, I say in general, you need at least a billion dollar market for the most part. And that's, that's at the bare minimum. Like that is barely, barely clearing the hurdle. Um, ideally your market is several billion dollars in size so that there are, there's a lot of TAM to go out there and get. Um, that's not to say that you can't be creating a new market, but your pitch is going to be a heck of a lot harder. Uh, if you have to convince somebody that you've got a startup with an unproven business model with a team of founders who may or not, may not be experienced who is creating a new market. That's, that's really yeah. hard. Well, a famous company that really struggled with that was Airbnb, right? They went around all, this, uh, all the investors trying to find somebody who would believe them when they said, hey, people actually want to pay to stay well, at the beginning in an, on an airbed in your uh, living room, right? And get breakfast. That was the whole name, airbed, airbed and breakfast. And um, I know they've spent a long time trying to change that name because that's not what they do anymore. But um, in the grand scheme of things, you know, nobody believed it. It was like, yeah, sharing economy, whatever, but really uh, inviting people into your home. Of course, now it's very obvious that there was a market there, but they had to fight hard to let people believe that this was a thing that people would do. Exactly. Yeah. And we're actually going to show that as an example. Um, and we'll discuss what they did there, which was smart. Um, in, in, there are ways to show that you have a big market, even if your particular solution is not sort of like the cookie cutter thing that people in that market want. So we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit here. So what let, let, there's a few uh, terms that VCs will throw around that it's pretty important for uh, founders to know. There's TAM, SAM, SOM, like what the heck are these things? Can you define them for folks? Yeah, so TAM, SAM, SOM is a, is a quick trio that gets thrown around a lot. Uh, the TAM is a total addressable market. That is basically, when you think about market size, that is probably what you're thinking of. Um, it's worth being careful here because uh, your uh, total addressable market is actually, or total available market, sometimes people call it that, um, it needs to be what the actual business does. So if you're creating tax software, your total addressable market isn't the total value of all taxes collected in the US. You know, it's very tempted to use that enormous number, but you know, that is not what you're going after. You're going after the uh, tax software slice of the tax market. Uh, the next one is the SAM. So that's the serviceable available market. Now you've taken your entire market and you're saying, hey, these are, the, these are the customers that I can actually serve with my industry. To use the tax example again, if you do corporate tax software, then you know the small businesses and individuals are just out of the picture. You can't serve them. So the entire available market might very well be every taxpayer, but there's different types of tax pay taxpayers that are served in different ways. Similarly, if you're looking at um, uh, fitness equipment, for example, you know all of fitness, and then as a subset of that, you have all bikes, and as a subset of that, you have all road bikes. If you make road bikes, 
you can't make a claim to all fitness equipment. So you have to be pretty careful about what it is you're going after. And then the final term that gets thrown around a lot is SOM. That is the serviceable, obtainable market. And sometimes it's SOM within a, within a certain time frame. So serviceable, uh, 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 serviceable, obtainable market within the first year. Now you've really drilled down to like, this is the size of the market. This is the part we address. And this is the part that we are going to address first, right? So uh, your TAM might actually be a global market, but your SOM might be, okay, we're starting just in the Bay Area or we're starting just in San Francisco or just the US. And so you're actually restricting the amount of uh, market you're going after to begin with. And that really helps um, uh, with the planning when it comes to marketing, sales, and all these kinds of things. But it also shows like even in the in the smaller market that you're going after, there still needs to be a billion dollar plus market there, right? Because if not, it doesn't make sense to invest. That's right. So, you know, think about your revenues will be whatever percent of the market you can actually capture. Yeah. So if there are only a billion dollars worth of revenue in your market available, in order to be a venture scale business, you basically need to get 10% of that, which is hard. It is very hard to get 10% of a market. Now yeah. there are, be very careful because there are companies that have done this like Google. Google has what, 92% of the search market share in the United States. That is really rare. So just be prepared for an eye roll by a venture capitalist. If you say you can get 100% of a market or 90% of a market, that is really, really hard to do. Yeah. So best case scenario, you have, let's say a $10 billion market and you get 5% of that. Oh my gosh, you have a huge revenue line item. Uh, that is amazing. Totally. And Secondly, remember, it has to be realistic, right? So if you're talking here about if your go-to-market strategy doesn't reflect what you're doing here, so that's a different slide, but you've got to pay attention to the two of them connect. There's this, there's this saying like, oh, sell something to 1% of all the people in China. Yes, but how are you going to reach them? How is that actually going to happen? So if your sum is very disconnected from your go-to-market strategy, you're going to get some very difficult questions. I think we're probably going to mention that five or 10 times during this particular slide. Like your, your go-to-market strategy needs to very tightly overlap with what the addressable market is and how those people want to purchase a product. Like yep. full stop, just remember that. Be prepared on this slide for people to question your go-to-market strategy and your sales and marketing. So just be ready that is very likely. I would say that's probably going to happen at least 25% of the time when you talk yeah. about this slide. There and there's another important thing that I like to talk to my uh, customers about, or to my clients about, which is, you know, sometimes you have an incredibly niche business that can be fantastically successful, so enormously profitable. But if your uh, sum is very small, you're very simply not venture investable. That doesn't mean it's a terrible business, but it means that as, when a venture capitalist look at, looks at your numbers and sees, well, actually, there's no way I can get a 10x return out of this, then you're dead in the water. So you really got to pay attention here that this, this slide should shout, this is an enormous opportunity. Because if and it doesn't, you've got to make it a no-brainer. The VC should not have to do any math or have any cognitive thought process to understand that big number. Yeah. Now, I, want to, I want to put a nuance in here, and we're probably going to talk about this again as well. But if you it is totally normal and actually it's often an excellent strategy for a startup to start in a particular niche. So using your tax software example, perhaps your company starts by making tax software for small businesses. And then that's a certain size market. And then next to that is a is tax software for enterprises. That's your next step that increases your market. And then the next item is oh, we're going to make tax software for small accounting firms and then for large accounting firms and then for personal taxes. And eventually you get to this huge market. Most venture capitalists understand and actually like the concept of a niche strategy at first expanding. So you, and I've seen concentric circles used for this to make a really big TAM number um, and help on, help the VC kind of understand your progression. It's a lot easier on the sales and marketing side to start in a niche and to grow from there. Yeah. Many, many companies have done that successfully. So don't be afraid to do that. Just make sure you're showing those layers of onions, I like to call it, or concentric circles of a bigger and bigger market that you're going to step into as you kind of get that uh, beachhead into the first one. So yeah. don't be afraid to start with a niche market. Just make sure on this slide, it's a no brainer for the VC to see like, hey, there's actually billions of dollars of market out here. I'm just starting right here, but I'm going to go there. Yeah. And from a go-to-market strategy point of view, this is actually a really good strategy to get a foothold in the market in the first place, right? Yeah. Um, doing something very niche and making sure you serve that audience incredibly well. But for example, there are some really good CRMs or customer relationship management systems, right? But 
the more niche they are, the better they do. So you have like a CRM specifically for dentists. You have a CRM specifically for hairdressers. You have one for beauty salons. And, you know, because they're so focused on the thing they do the best, they have like a really good sales strategy there. They can go to every beauty salon and say, hey, this is exactly what you need, has exactly everything you need. And then from there, they can do brand extensions. They can do or uh, product variations, which is like this one is for beauty salons. This one is for hairdressers. This one is for you know, another type of beauty product, but because they're started focused, you, you can build out that way. If you right. say, Hey, we're going to take on Salesforce. Nobody's going to believe you, even though they're also a CRM system that could be used for hairdressers. So think about it that way as well. So uh, a lot of times for the slides we've been talking about, uh, like our traction slide, they change as a company matures by stage. How does, how does that this slide potentially change higher at all for the stage of company? Does it change? I think the actual market size itself uh, is probably pretty stable unless the market itself is evolving. But as you become a more mature company, you actually have other opportunities that become possible, right? When Google started, they started as a search engine and now they do everything, right? Um, calendars, email, all the other things. But if you come to a VC and says, I'm going to take over, I'm going to take on Google on every front, you're going to have a pretty bad conversation there. The thing is, eventually, if you're an extremely successful company, you're just going to grow so big that you've essentially gobbled up the whole market in theory, right? And so in order to grow further, you have to think about where can you still find growth? And you can do that by thinking about the market differently. Um, I know we briefly talked about Uber in, in previous episodes, but I'd like to mention them again because they're actually really good at this kind of thing, right? They started out taking over... Uh, kind of taking on the taxi industry head on with their own taxis. Then they kind of borrowed Lyft's uh, drive your own car model. But now they're doing so much more stuff, right? They're doing partial delivery in some markets. They're doing food delivery. And those uh, are huge extensions into all sorts of directions. Let's let's share that uh, pitch deck slide, actually. We've got it as an example. So let me me go ahead and share that right now. Um, So this is, uh, in theory, Uber cabs either series A or seed deck, they were very early, mm-hmm. okay? And they are claiming the overall market is essentially the amount of taxi spend and limis- limousine spend in the United States. So $4.2 mm-hmm. $4. billion market. Which is a big market, you know, it's big. more than it's more than a billion, so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and this was, and, and, you know, basically they're pointing out there's not a lot of concentration here. And so there's, they're basically saying like, hey, listen, like big market, it's it's growing, you know. There's it's it's highly fragmented, um, and this this was attractive to uh, VCs. Like it, yep. it, this this worked. Um, they raised a ton of money. Now I do want to point out that Uber's revenue, I think in 2021 was almost 15 billion. Yeah. So they have so grown clearly the pie. that isn't growing there. <laughs> <laughs> they they have grown the pie. It's it's dangerous as a uh, as a founder to claim that you're going to grow the pie that aggressively. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, you can, you can say that you expect to grow the pie. You might might be something you want to show verbally to prove to the VC that you're thinking big and that, um, you know, there's a lot of opportunity here to get them excited. I wouldn't necessarily like put that on your slide though, because you can induce a little bit of eye rolls if you're not careful. Yeah, totally. Well, even like uh, even uh, Uber's baby brother uh, or sister uh, Lyft, you know, they're, they're running 2.5. Three billion dollars now. So Lyft is now doing half the market that Uber thought was the size of the market. And this is a beautiful dynamic about seeing these types of companies, uh, as you say, you know, they, they grew the market. Yeah. Now, earlier, they, like people use Ubers and Lyfts now in ways that they wouldn't dream of using taxis. Exactly. Uh, and I don't think they predicted that when they started out on this journey, but now the entire um, transportation infrastructure has just changed because these companies exist. Yeah, but again, I would be very careful. I would not say, hey, it's a it's a $5 million market right now, but we're going to grow it to a $5 billion market. It, that's really hard. That is, right. that is a really hard thing to do. Now, again, there will be moments where you actually are creating a new market, a new product, a new service that has never existed before. Um, but hopefully there's something tangential that you can show. So to the, but let's say you were pitching Amazon Web Services, AWS, like, you know, the, basically the dawn of cloud computing you would do the overall hosted and ser- like overall server market, overall data center market. Like you, you would use that as your tangential market and you say, Hey, we're going to deliver this thing, but in a different way. Right. Yeah. So, you know, you want the big numbers on this slide so that there's no math required, no leap of faith required. It needs to be like, yeah, it is a big market. Wow. I'm excited. Yeah. Well, and hilariously, you know, Amazon, everybody thinks of the, of the shop, but AWS in itself generates $45 billion per year. 
It is ridiculously valuable. And it essentially started out as a footnote because Bezos was being angry with, with having to pay all these uh, hosting fees. I'm like, well, maybe we can, once we build out all the infrastructure, maybe we can help other people. Well, exactly. it turns out that wasn't a bad idea exactly. <laughs> from selling books to uh, selling other things. Right. So anyway, uh, kind of going back to the core topic here, does this, does this change based on the stage of company? Potentially, as you mature and work your way into other companies, potent, or industries, or tangential markets. Okay, potentially, yeah. um, but every 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 company should have one of these things. Okay, I don't care if you're a biotech company attacking a particular cancer, or if you're a consumer product, or if you're an enterprise company, you know, selling into the Fortune 500. You need to have this slide. Okay? Yeah, it's very important. Um, and so again, why is it important? One, you're proving that you're, you're going after a venture scale space and that you're that ambitious founder that wants to build a VC scale business. Okay. This is, this is definitely one of the slides I see people trip up on. In fact, when we do our top pitch deck mistakes, I think having too small of a market is probably one of the top mistakes I see founders make. Yeah. And I guess the other thing I, I, I think I think it's one of the most important slides, but it's also important to talk about market trajectory, right? Ah, yes. Uh, we mentioned yep. uh, tax. I've mentioned tax software a few times. Tax software is pretty flat, right? Everybody who was going to buy tax software has probably bought tax software. It's probably not going to grow exponentially, mm -hmm. which means if you want market share, you have to fight for it. You have to take over that kind of thing. You have to take over other people's market share. Right. or create new market. And we've just said, those are the two hardest things you can possibly do. However, if you're doing metaverse stuff right now, or Web3 or crypto or one of those things, it is a large market, but it's probably going to grow. And in that, and in that universe, you kind of get this whole uh, rising tide raises all boats syndrome, where if you manage to cling, like do an early land grab, get 5% market share, and then grow with the market, like to use the Uber example, they thought the market was going to be 5 billion. Now it's at least 20 billion. If you manage to just cling on to 3%, your business is going to be on an incredible trajectory. So think about the market trajectory. Think about what the, what the, met, uh, what the, um, what the larger uh, context is of the market you're, uh, you're, you're in. Right. And again, remember how it relates to your sales and marketing and your go-to-market strategy. Yep. Right. So if you're selling into large enterprises, they're going to expect a sales team, right? Big, big companies don't, kind of click to auto agree to terms of service and put a credit card down for a quarter of a million dollar or a million dollar product. There's a sales cycle where a salesperson is going to have to schmooze, et cetera. There's contracting, et cetera. So just keep in mind that the sales and marketing is, is intimately tied to this. Okay. So this slide yep. is important because you're showing size, you're showing scale, you're showing you're ambitious. Maybe yep. that's two, two fingers. Uh, you're showing trajectory. So hopefully something is growing really well. And three, you're reinforcing, you know, who the buyers are and who you're trying to sell to. And yep. then five, you, you, it's, it's mashing or mish, meh, ugh, it is connecting with your sales and marketing slide in a way that's very logical and is a no brainer. Okay. Yeah. So you don't really want people to have to think too much about this slide. You want them to get yep. very excited. And, and these slides on. typically have a lot of numbers on them, right? So there's a couple of ways of getting to the market size. Uh, do you want to talk about that a little bit, Healy? Yeah, and I think it's time to start showing some examples and getting into do the, it. the meat of the slide. So we, we showed you the Uber one, um, and the source on that was uh, like a research study from INSEAD, right? And essentially, there's the top down and the bottoms up. So I'm gonna I'm gonna share my screen, and we will we all kind of jump between the two, and then we'll dig into what they are. So this is a bottom up uh, market size. I hopefully everybody can see this. And then um, this is an Airbnb example, which is more of a top down. Yep. Uh, we do have pitch deck examples available for free on the Cruise Consulting website uh, at uh, cruiseconsulting.com pitch dash deck. Um, so we have a enterprise one. Okay, here's an enterprise one. And then we have a consumer one. Yep. Um, Hiya, why don't we start with the bottoms up? It's a really great way to do a, a market size slide. Yeah, this is the... Um... This is the uh, Tam Sam Som thing we talked about earlier. At the bottom there, you have your um, total address supermarket. That's like the number of gyms in the United States for this one particular thing, right? Uh, serviceable market. So in this, in this instance, this company is going after multiple location gyms, so not independent gyms, so basically gym chains. And so they've said, okay, the serviceable market is we're going to ignore all the single boutique gyms and we're only going after multiplication gyms. And then they're saying, okay, what are we going after in the first year? That's their sum. In this case, a thousand gyms 
um, that have online class signups and stuff. And they put some pricing around that too. I think this is actually a super elegant way of doing it because if you if you believe the numbers, if you think, yeah, there are 200,000 gyms, yeah, sure, there are 4,000 gyms that have multiple locations. The last step there, it's kind of impenetrable, right? As, as long as you believe the numbers that are, that are the basis for this projection, you end up with a really good um, good story around this. Yeah. And again, this is, this is pretty powerful, right? You're saying, hey, I know exactly where I'm starting. I know the exact customer who's correct for me right now. And hey, yeah, it's, it's, they're not big. It's not big, but don't worry. I, I, I've got right around the corner is this next opportunity and I'm going to be able to step into that. And then right around the corner from that is the next opportunity. And it is really big, right? Yep. So you're not, it's not, there's no leap of faith required here. It's just, hey, this is a logical way for me to advance the ball. Yeah. And I think this is actually my favorite way of, of presenting this. If you can do it this way, A++, because it is so hard to argue with, right? right? And I think so, just yeah. shortcutting that would be very helpful. So let's go to a top down that it's potentially arguable against. Mm -hmm. Like this is Airbnb, right. which again, we mentioned was kind of hard because you're basically couch surfing initially, like that was their initial market, right? So, yeah. you know, a lot of travel is booked. A lot of people buy stuff online uh, and we think we can get to 84 like, million worth of this small numbers but then there's uh, yeah i guess this is probably trips as opposed to dollars this would this be more trips, powerful trips yeah there would be a lot more powerful if there, were, if there were dollars on this slide to be honest but yeah um this this one is a little bit tougher right they are they are trying to say where they're starting from and how they and how it's actually a big overall market they're going after um yeah. it's a little tougher i think i think what i really like for our um hey let's talk about a, a overall big market is uh the uh, four P's example pitch deck that, that we have created together, right? Yep. And this one, we're throwing out a massive number in terms of plumbing businesses in the United States, mm -hmm. right? And a huge number of plumbers and how much is spent on plumbing. Now here, this one is a little wishy-washy, right? Because dollars spent on plumbing does not equal dollars spent on plumbing software, Yep. right? But, uh, but basically saying that there's like 350,000 small businesses that are addressable here. That's a pretty, that's a big number at the price points that this company is talking about. Yeah, totally. And I really, so, so the, there's an assumption in here, which is that plumbing is a really solid and predictable market, right? Uh, as we said earlier, I, I don't think realistically that plumbing as an industry is going to be a hugely growing market. That's what I would have thought. Then I did a bit of research. It turns out it's growing at a 3.5% CAGR. That is not awful, right? It, it has some growth which means, uh, so CAGR is uh, compound annual growth rate, um, but it means that you actually have a, a market that is growing. And what that probably means is that the industry in general is growing, uh, the kind of uh, installation of new plumbing in buildings is growing. And so the, the story you're telling here really is that there is a very large number of businesses that are available. That's right. Yeah. And so, you know, please don't get hung up on this particular example. We made this company up in order to create a, a free pitch tech template. Like there's, there's pretty, it yep. might be pretty easy to pick holes into this. And we obviously are not plumbers or software sellers in the plumber industry. So, but the, but the point here is that there's a lot of big numbers on here and it's not particularly hard for the VC to think that you've got a lot of folks that you can sell to. Yep. And again, this is going to match with the go to market slide where we do talk about um, the growth and the sales team and things like that. So this this clicks nicely in with that strategy and reinforces how the company expects to grow. Now, we're going to switch to a different top-down one that we created that I actually think is a little too hand-wavy um, yeah, and garbage. maybe a little off the market. So I don't. <laughs> I think if you were to present this one, this is for our um, beer subscription uh, consumer service, which is a challenging sounding business model. Uh, and so what is, this is basically saying is, hey, it's a, the craft beer industry is really big. Right. Uh, and, well, and the, more importantly, if you look at the uh, if you look at the shape of that curve, it is flattening. Right. It had rapid growth and then it flattened out. As an investor, I would look at this and go, "Wait a minute, this market is is plateauing. Why are you trying to do something here?" Uh, and I, I actually go into that in the book, where I'm saying, "Hey, this this slide in this one particular instance is an actual warning sign to investors." So you've got to think very carefully about where. Like, how are you going to get some of this market and how does that show up in terms of the storytelling in your pitch? Um, yeah, I would be very worried if somebody put this in front of me, I wanted to raise money. Yeah, I know a better way to do this might be to do the uh, like food delivery market. Yeah. Because there are a lot of food, beer and actually alcohol delivery services. So that might be a better thing to put in there because it's probably decent sized and growing pretty aggressively. Yep. Um, and then you can attach your competition side will come later, but you're, you're kind of starting to attach yourself to hot companies 
at the mm -hmm. moment, these companies are hot. Who knows when you're listening to this, this presentation in, in a year or so, perhaps some of these uh, home delivery companies won't be as hot, but right now they're considered hot. So to the extent you can help the VC connect like your idea with other examples that are doing really well, that's really powerful. And this is a slide that can help you do that if you do this correctly. Again, yeah. I don't, I don't really love the way this one was done, but, uh, but it's, it's a free template. So you should, you should dig it. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Okay, great. So let's talk about some of the most common issues mm -hmm. that we have seen on this slide. And I have to say that again, this is a slide that does kill a lot of venture deals. Like if you do this yep. wrong, you can basically shut the meeting down pretty fast. Yeah. So I think one of the things that is worth noting is that, um, Market sizing is done a lot by uh, consulting firms, right? There's a lot of really big uh, businesses that are doing a lot of like, um, like investment uh, analysts, uh, uh, like uh, brand extensions for big businesses, which means a lot of the um, consulting firms are out there doing research on this. They have probably come up with a market size for almost anything you can think of, you know, projectors sold, helicopters, whatever. So make sure you Google it. Because if, uh, if an investor is really serious about wanting to invest in this, they will do that Google search. They will buy whatever reports they need to as part of their due diligence. And if your number is really far away from what this uh, consulting firm has come up with, you have to be really well prepared to defend why your number is so different. Yeah, you should have a story there. And, yep. and you should be aware of those major research reports that have been published. And you know, personally, for really big, well understood markets, I generally think it's okay just to use a third party research as your market size. Yep. Um, there are some VCs who don't love that. They strongly prefer the bottoms up. I would suggest, again, you always Google and look at the Twitter feeds and the blogs of the folks you're, you're meeting with before you meet with them to see if they have any weird nuances on this. But again, if it's like a big industry, it's really well understood. Those reports are, are usually pretty okay to use on this. Um, and then you're using this slide as a foil to talk about kind of where you're going and kind yeah. of how, how big of an entrepreneur you want to be and things like that, right? You're selling something big um, and you're focusing less around like, is the XYZ market huge? It's like, no, everybody knows XYZ market is huge. Here are the numbers, it's growing. I'm going to, I'm really excited to take on this market. Right? It's going to be a big yeah. company. Like that's what the message is. Okay. Um, I think the next issue that's pretty common um, is one we've talked about a little as well as like measuring the right thing. That's where the mm -hmm. beer, the beer slide didn't do a great job because it was showing overall craft beer sales, which is not necessarily, it's not really one for one what the, what the company is, right? Yep. Again, it's like overall tax revenue for the US government does not equal what the tax software market is, right? So right. that's the next thing I think, make sure you're measuring the right thing. Yeah. 100%. And I think it's also being very careful about uh, making sure that the thing you are defining as your market is actually realistically the market you're going after. Um, I mentioned the sports equipment thing earlier, but especially when you're doing stuff in like pro sports or when you're doing stuff in like gambling or like really, really big sounding markets, um, like be super honest with yourself. Is the, is what you're defining as the market here something that your uh, product actually addresses at all? Because a lot of the times, you know, founders get so tempted to say like, look, it's an enormous market. Like, well, yeah, but your product is definitely not going to fully address this. And it, it means that it just gets shot down and you, you end up with so much pain trying to explain why that is the number you're going after. It shows you're yeah. not a sophisticated founder. It, it shows that you don't know what you're talking about. So here is where if you're pitching and you're getting hung up on this slide, like if VCs are really pushing you hard on this slide, um, they're probably not going to tell you why they're not going to invest. That's just not what they do, unfortunately. But right. the reason is if you're getting there, they might not have faith in your market slide. So you might want to go iterate. And if you have some, some investors who you're very friendly with, you might want to ask them, is this slide working for me? Because maybe it's not, because I feel like I'm getting pushed back. And then you just go and you, you, you find a different way to do it. Yeah. Okay? So don't, if it's not working, it's not working. And don't let this thing be the place where you, the hill you die on. Like the, the, you should, you should, figure out what's going to work here, right? Make sure, yeah. but make sure you're attacking something big, but figure out this is going to work. Yeah, the 100%. other place that there's a problem is if it, if the market is too small. So let's say. I have a great market. example for that. Oh, um, go for one it. Of my, go. One of my previous companies called Life Folder and it was basically end of life planning. And our, uh, you know, our idea was like, well, everybody dies. Turns out that the number of people who plan for end of life is very small. And the people who are willing to pay for it is vanishingly small. So we had an enormous TAM but that the SAM was tiny and the SOM was essentially non-existent. So be super careful on that kind of thing. That is a huge problem. That's huge. Like 
issue. The other place I've seen a problem is where, uh, let's say you have a product that is, you know, it costs $10,000 a year, but your market is there's only a hundred companies that can purchase that. Yep. You don't have a big market. Your market is tiny. You have a problem, right? So be careful that you're actually not by design going into way too tiny of a market uh, because you're not venture investable. And the VCs will definitely do the math around that. that if you say something like, hey, I, my product is useful for the top three pharmaceutical companies in the world and that's it. And the price point is half a million dollars. Well, then your market size is $1.5 million. Like that is too small. So right. that math is really easy to do by the venture capitalists. So make sure that you thought through that. Yeah. Yeah, and this is the nature of VC, right? You see so many pitches, you see so many slices of the market, and uh, you might be able to do trick people on other slides. This one is not one of them. It's just right. not going to happen because this is so crucially important to whether or not it makes sense to the VC's business model at the very heart of it. So, yeah, yeah. D do your homework. Yeah. Uh so another thing here that kind of leads nicely into sometimes you might be pitching a VC who has been a founder in this industry or has a, an investment that they exited in this industry or that failed in this industry, or they, the, it is possible the VC is a true expert on this space. And you probably ought to know that before you get into the meeting by researching who they are. Yeah. Um, but it could be an issue if the VC knows more than you do. And I'm not necessarily saying that um, it's... Uh, it's okay to be sort of naive, like it's always okay to like not know everything, but when the, when the VC is telling you stuff that you don't know, that is like blowing your mind or is dramatically changing your impressions of the market, you maybe have a little more work to do as a founder. And it's, it's going to be really tough to get that investor to want to invest in you because, you know, you've come to them with this idea in a space and they're kind of poking holes in your market size or, or how the market is, is structured. You got a problem. Like that, that is something yeah. to really be careful with. So basically you have to actually do your homework. <laughs> yeah. Well, and the flip side is also true, right? So if you do come across one of those VCs, they might be an incredibly powerful board member because they have connections, they have ideas, they have insights. Um, you know, you, you got to convince them that it's a good idea to invest in you. But then once you get them to that point, th they can be incredible leverage. So it kind of works both way, but clearly you're not going to close the investment unless, uh, <laughs> exactly. unless you convince them that you know what you're doing. Right. And to the extent you do get in a, in a meeting and you realize that, that that venture investor actually is incredibly knowledgeable, like, you know, be humble, ask them a lot of questions, be excited about their knowledge, uh, you know, acknowledge where they have a view that has different, been different than what you've been thinking about and, you know, thank them. Like being humble and like, because they're looking for someone who's coachable. Uh, so if you can show that, you, you may actually turn the the issue of the market side slide not really working out perfectly based on this person being more knowledgeable you into a little bit of an advantage for them realizing that you're the type of person that is like a go is, is humble enough and is like reflective self-reflective enough to to learn and wants to be yeah. coached because you know again vcs want to, want to be coaches yeah and i was going to mention this in the summary actually but i think there is an interesting flip side to that too if you talk to a vc who really understands the market or if the market size is really obvious they might take one look at the slide and go yeah move on Right. That Sometimes is fine. Yeah, is that's fine. fine. Next slide. Take, like, it, oh, take it. Go you've, go. you've been so prepared for this slide and to defend it, but they just go, eh, yeah, that makes sense. Next. Listen to them. There's no point in, in trying to drive home a point that's already been made. Yeah. And, uh, and exactly. you know, yeah, unless, unless there's some particular nuance in here that is important on your go to market. Yeah. Like, it's yeah, just like, yeah, if they're like, yeah, of course it's a big market. Moving on. You know, no yeah. problem. Um, 100%. And then the final point issue or the final issue that we've mentioned a few times is this is going to have to match your go to market or your sales and marketing slide. Okay. So it's essentially, if you're like, Hey, it's a $10 billion market enterprise software. And then your go to market slide says, you're going to spend all your money on Facebook advertising. You know, guess what? Large enterprises don't make decisions based on what they, what's Facebook advertising. Right. So just keep, keep that in mind. Very, very like be really thoughtful about that. Yep. All right. Well, let's wrap it up here. This is perhaps one of the, one of the most important slides. I think we've said that several times now, but this is this yep. is where I would say a huge percent of pitches die. So what do we got to do? What's the summary here, Haya? Like, take us out. So I think it's a really good idea to pay very close attention to the uh, reaction you get, right? If they look skeptical, be prepared to dig in. If they look like they kind of believe you, great, move on, right? Don't. It's very tempting to spend a lot of time because it's important, but if you don't have to, you don't have to. Um, it's particularly important for if you're doing a very niche company, 
and your um, SOM is very specific and maybe a little bit small, spend a bit of extra time here to show that, okay, your current SOM is small, but here's the, the ways you're thinking of expanding this, the company, uh, whether uh, vertically or geographically or whatever, like show that you are realistic, but also that there is a huge opportunity. Uh, you yeah. can do both, but you've got to kind of work on the story with that. Exactly. And realistically, what this all boils down to is the answer to a really simple question, which is, if everything goes to plan, how big can this company get, right? And if you end up with an enormous number, fantastic. That is what they want to see. And now it's possible to invest. If they don't believe you or if, they, if you're turned up with a tiny number, it's like, well, it's just not VC investable. So that is, that is the most important thing about this slide. Proof that you're going big, that you're ambitious, you're trying to build a venture scale business. That's what this slide is for. Make sure that story is told here. Yeah, love it. All right, well, everyone, thank you so much. Uh, and again, go to cruiseconsulting.com slash pitch dash deck to get the free templates and all these recordings. And uh, we hope that uh, we hope you find this helpful. See you again soon.